Great, so uh, we're very pleased to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by just um, bouncing off the previous talk, actually, the previous few talks. So we're, we're very much thinking about the role of compassion education. Um, Jonathan's talk earlier was about compassion around uh, uh, about um, sort of communication with, uh, through literacy and so on. And I'm thinking about compassion really around communication around our social and emotional interactions with the children and people we work with. So a slightly different focus here. I'm thinking about the role of compassionate interactions through communication, and that, as we've seen, that can be in a huge variety of different ways, and about connection as well, particularly in our work, uh, again, with children and young people. So I'm very pleased to be um, working and talking today uh, with Max J. Green. So Max is just going to begin with a brief introduction. So, um, I'm an actor, and also I'm an IT analyst full time. But yeah, and I've got autism, OCD, ADHD, and epilepsy. And this is John. Um, John used to be a former teacher of mine. Um, brilliant teacher, learned a lot from him, took a lot of skills and knowledge away. So, thank you for paying me later. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you. 100 pounds, yeah. <laughs> and John has got loads of these uh, abbreviations. So, I always think it's funny that I just add all of mine underneath mine. So people think I'm a professional in all that. <laughs> so I think the point we're making there is we've both got very different labels associated with us, actually. Um, but to be honest, you know, what we're hoping to explore today is that actually we're, we're, we're the same, really, in terms of uh, particularly this focus around compassion. So a brief opening presentation. I'm um, exploring some work around the role of compassion education. So I'm hoping to provide a brief overview of uh, compassion focus where of working with children and young people, just to talk briefly about where that's come from and how that's developing, um, and Max is going to talk a little bit about other aspects, so what are you talking about today, Max? So I'll just be talking about uh, things that have happened, I suppose, since I, since I was in school, things that worked in school, things that didn't, and kind of what's happened after I left school and the struggles I've had later on in life. Thank you, Max. So, so let's um, begin by thinking about why there's a need for compassion education. I'll just give you a minute to read that quotation. So again, thinking about the current climate in education presently, I'm quite concerned about um, the sort of rise in exclusion presently, um, some of the common policy initiatives that are happening at the moment around kind of zero tolerance, no excuses approaches, the increase in the use of isolation clues, uh, you know, fixed term exclusions, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to be um, exploring some other ways of thinking about interacting with children and young people, and particularly those with complex learning needs. Just a quotation here from Professor Barry Carpenter. We recognise that actually we're seeing a generation of really quite complex learners, uh, and that's related to this idea about vulnerability. Now we could spend a whole afternoon unpicking what vulnerability means and why children and young people might be particularly vulnerable. But recently there was a report by Professor Townsend Ford which looks at the increase in the number of children uh, with, a, with emotional disorders. So this is a, a longitudinal study by the University of Exeter and mental health um, needs of our children are actually increasing. Which means that a number of our learners, a significant minority of learners, might be deemed to be kind of fragile in, in, in their educational context and our quest as educators then has to be thinking about how we can um, support these children in their emotional development. How can we support them to become that uh, emotionally strong? And that's not talking about resilience, that's not talking about grit or character or some of the other stuff that's being debated at policy level at the moment. Um, but this is drawing very much from the work of uh, Professor Paul Gilbert, um, who's been developing compassion-focused therapeutic ways of working over the last 40 years. Uh, initially in one-to-one -one clinical context, um, around things like eating, eating disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, any, any um, sort of mental health condition that might be related to kind of experience of distress. Um, over the last sort of recent years, they've been developing compassion-focused approaches with healthcare professionals, so doctors, nurses, midwives, um, psychotherapy students, and so on. And there really hasn't been much work looking at the role of compassion therapeutic ways of working with children and families. And only recently has this work been um, developed in education. So it's a really exciting time to think about how as educators we can start thinking about how these compassion-focused principles can be developed in our school. And I think you're, you know, you're very familiar with the works of, um, for example, Neil Hawkes and the values-based education. There's much more awareness about adverse childhood experiences, nurture group approaches, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think this fits in really nicely. We've got an excellent talk this afternoon with um, Dr. Jeffrey James uh, this afternoon, thinking about solution-focused ways of working, and I think the two work really well together as well. Mary Ralford, um, again, is on Twitter.
looked at and does a lot of tweeting or twittering. Well, people um, and again, she's, she's really worth thinking about in terms of her work around um, education, and I'll be recommending a couple of um, open access publications around some of her work in, in secondary schools a little bit later on. So what compassion-focused approaches? They draw on a variety of different theoretical um, ways of thinking about the kind of uh, neuroscience of emotion, um, thinking about where we've come from today from an evolutionary perspective and drawing very heavily on attachment theory. Uh, very much thinking about early childhood experience around social and developmental psychology, and also influenced by a kind of Buddhist approach and psychologies to explore human suffering and distress. So actually how and why it is that human suffer and how compassion may provide a way of supporting, responding to some of this suffering. And really, I'm interested because it's underpinned by a philosophy of compassion and humanism. We're all the same, for example. Um, so, defining compassion. A nice little definition here is a sensitivity to our own or other people's distress plus a motivation to prevent or alleviate this distress. First we've got to recognise it, then we've got to do something about it. So it's noticing. Um, distress and difficulties in ourselves or others and doing something about it. And it aims then to think about developing compassion, motivation and compassion for ourselves and others and also to be uh, open to receiving compassion from others. So compassion focused approach is based around three realities. The first one is true to say for, um, around this kind of evolutionary perspective that we're this kind of emergent species we were here today after you know, millions of years of evolution, the struggles of other life forms, for example, most of which are now extinct. But the idea about this compassion-focused approach is actually depathologizing uh, particularly mental health concerns um, and understanding that some concerns around distress, and particularly in the educational context, are actually quite acceptable given the distress um, around some of our children and young people, and some of which is kind of influenced in, in educational context. The second reality is that actually we're around for a fairly short amount of time, and that during that time, you know, as we age, we're increasingly likely to suffer uh, ourselves through pain, illness, disease, and we're all going to die at some point. Jesus, positive John. Stop it. It's I'm true. Sure. <laughs> that I'm, afraid. I'm afraid it's true, Max. So uh, when we're thinking about who we are and who we are today, particularly how we've become who we are today, that's best understood, I'm sure you appreciate, through this kind of biopsychosocial perspective. Yes, there might be um, biological influences there, which have an impact potentially on psychological aspects, but all that happens in social contexts. And we're very interested, particularly in the school context today, and how we can alleviate some of these um, issues. So it's very you know, true to say that who we are is a complex interaction between all this stuff and that we're socially constructed, essentially. It's quite an interesting experiment to imagine that if we were born at a different time or a different place, how else might we have developed, for example? Um, if I was born, for example, to you know, the head of a, 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 a mafia unit somewhere, I might be very different to who I am today. So, uh, actually... Yeah, that's on the side. That's on the side. Yeah. Okay. Get on the side, on the side. What, mafia? Yeah, not very often. Uh, so, rather than fearing difference, I think we should embrace it. If, you, if you're familiar again with Annie Chapel, recognised on, on, on Twitter again, runs the Flip the Narrative campaign. It's all about recognising and celebrating difference in individuality, and recognising, yes, we're different, but we're one, we're human. So that's my brief introduction to compassion-focused approaches. And Max is just going to tell us a little bit now about perhaps what didn't work initially in your educational experience. We do, and then we're going to warm up into something a bit, a bit nicer. Yeah, of course. So that's me in primary school. Um, I was trying to go for some kind of look. I don't know what the look was. I think it's cool, look, actually. Yeah. Um, that's me in secondary school, and then that's me at college. So things that didn't work, I always find this subject quite tricky because I think sometimes the things that didn't work are the things that actually aren't in place. Mm. So uh, things that didn't work, so it was the understanding of school. You know, my mum would have to go down to school quite a lot, bless her, down there probably most nights, most days, whatever, you know. And I think the things that don't work is the lack of teaching that we actually get in schools about conditions to the students, to the parents, to all of the above, because I've actually found that some parents are just as judgmental as the children. 
and they'd be like, oh, I don't want to hang around with him, don't hang around with Max, you know, to the point where I would be invited around people's houses, and then suddenly the next day that would change because, because of why. And I'm too young at that point to understand why and what's actually going on. And nine times out of ten, it was probably the parents saying, actually, I don't want him around my house. Um, so primary school was very difficult. I couldn't talk till I was six. So uh, that was a difficult process as well, because then you've got uh, an autistic young man who's trying to communicate with people, but just really unable to do so. I'm making up for the talking now, obviously. Very good. <laughs> um, but it was just really hard to the point where I would interrupt football games and pick up the ball and run with it because I didn't know how to play football and that was my way of kind of trying to be part of, part of a friendship group and part of um, being understood. There was one teacher at primary school where my mum said, I think he's got autism, and she turned around and said, he hasn't got anything, he's just naughty. And it's very, the mindset back then, <coughs> obviously the Autism Act wasn't in as well, you know, so it was pre-2009. Um, so after that school, I then went to a secondary school with an ASD unit, and um, all my mates went up to the school up the road, and because I was statemented, I believe it's called something Education, else, health and care plan. Educational Health and Care Plan now, um, the government kind of got to pick what school I went to, and this school had an ASD unit, but unfortunately they wasn't very good, um, they actually just wanted students in there who had conditions, but went to their classes, done as they were told and progress. And I think it comes down to stats because I think a lot of schools would be like, okay, so how many people in your ASD unit went on to get a GCSE? And they didn't want the people that would hold that statistic down. So they were slowly ushered out um, to the point where I saw numerous amount of people that had complex uh, difficulties that were, that, were, that were issued down. And mine, I left the school because basically I was bullied at that school and there were seven people who threatened to beat me up. Um, I asked that the TA wouldn't sit next to me on the first day because I felt that that would be a target on my back to all the other students that, that I'm the go-to person to, um, to target and um, that was very difficult for me because the teacher did sit next to me and then everyone knew what they could pick on me for. Um, then went to John's um, school, which was lovely. Um, I always say the educational probably wasn't at what it was because the school at the time didn't offer GCSE, so that left me really bad in, instead for the future. But the support the school gave, you know, was, was second to none. But I'll get on that later. Yeah. But the educational side of it there wasn't as good as what it could be. And then I would say my time in college was difficult because it's. It's like, well, I'm going into the big world, big world, and it's and it's nastier, and it's and it's you know we think we've got it hard when we're at primary and secondary, and then you you go out to this beast that's called the world, and then you suddenly start. <laughs> to stop it. Yeah, I'm only right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then you're kind of independent. You're on your own. You know, you've got to know times. You've got to bring your equipment. You've got to know what's what. Am I working too hard? Am I not working enough? You're not given that that support at college to a point where I was writing 65 paid essays and I was actually writing probably too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, someone probably should have told me to put my pen down, to be honest. But, but um, I was writing so, so much and um, the teacher just marked it past and I didn't really feel that he read it. And, <laughs> not all 65 pages. No, no. Who would? Be oh, fair. Well, you probably would have snoring. Um, but he did mark what I wanted the mark to be, and I, I was quite discouraged by that. So I spoke to him, and um, anyway, I compared my marks to other people in the class, and I just wanted to see what they'd done that I didn't, and most of the stuff I'd done. But then I came across someone that copied and pasted all of their work, and he had a distinction. So autism, injustice kicks in, I'm going, oh my God, this isn't right. So I had it out with it, and this college teacher just started swearing at me. He said, you dis you, you know, you're disrespecting my effing marking, you know. I, I said, you disrespecting my work, I worked really hard on that. And he's going, you're going all across the effing class and looking at other people's work. 
And then I said to him, someone was cheating, and I said, I'm not prepared to tell you who it is. So he turned around and said, so you're going to make me remark all the effing work? And I said, well, <laughs> if that's what you said was in place, if people are cheating, then it's your, your position to do so. Mm. So college, again, was a different piece, and making friends again, you know, from primary, I made friends, then they were gone. Secondary school, found it hard to make friends, then they were gone. John's school, actually made more friends with the teachers, to be honest, because they were really helpful, and it was the first school I went to which helped, but I'll get on to that later. So it was the communication, making friendships, and the educational aspects to each different school was actually very different to their predecessors. So it was very difficult. Uh, so that was primary, secondary, and college. Right. So again, we're moving back, I mean, some really nice examples there at times that, you know, perhaps, well, not nice examples, I shouldn't say, but examples yeah, that sort of illustrate or, you know, shed, you know, I think actually support some of this stuff here around that kind of evolutionary um, perspective on our developing of, you know, particular competencies, psychologies, motives, emotions, cognitive um, competencies that have occurred through different stages throughout evolution. Is again, anyone just nodding their head? <laughs> very, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very familiar around, again, think about adverse childhood experiences, all that kind of stuff, the kind of trying brain, you know, reptilian, mammalian, and the neocortex, thinking about these developments of different capacities, emotions, motivations, and so on. And I think where we get stuck these days around particularly sort of um, mental health issues and issues around mental health needs is around sort of self-identity, um, sense of self, theory of mind, knowing what other people think, putting yourselves in their shoes, all that kind of stuff there. And again, you know, as a human species, we can be incredibly creative, we can solve loads of problems, we can do the most amazing things, um, but we can also get incredibly anxious, we can get incredibly worried, we can ruminate, we get caught in these kind of negative loop cycles, and, and that can be quite distressing at times. So thinking about the kind of this, what they call a tricky brain analogy, is recognizing how the old reptilian or emotional brain interacts with the new kind of neocortex and that kind of thinking and overthinking and overthinking and overthinking and so on. I mean, you know, thinking and overthinking about this presentation maybe in the days uh, preceding it. And again, that can cause you know, experiences, I wasn't quite at the highest level of anxiety <laughs> so when I went on the scale. Uh, I would have probably said it'd be about 50, 60, I would say, moderate, uh, you know, maybe strong, perhaps. Uh, certainly wasn't totally exact. So we need to be able to recognise that it's not our fault that we experience these kind of um, fluctuations around anxiety and distress. However, it is our responsibility to do something about it, and it is our responsibility to support our children and young people that may experience these in different particular contexts, for example. Um, so again, that self-awareness is wonderful. That idea about the sort of metacognitive ability is, is particularly positive, but it can also lead to trouble when we overthink things, for example. And again, thinking about the self-criticism, shame and distress. I'm really concerned when I hear about schools that you know, have um, experiences where actually shame is created in the children and young people. For it's example. not something when I joined the school. Yeah. Ah, yeah, exactly. Or even when I'm thinking about trying to write something for my doctoral studies, for example. Self-criticism and stress. But you know, we're very concerned about the kind of shame-based approaches in um, behaviour, uh, um, you know, thinking about behaviour at the moment and the stress that can cause children and young people. So there are definitely other ways of working, I would suggest. So moving forward in Max's uh, time. What happened next, Max? <laughs> we're doing well, are we? Five minutes each. I think it's going to be quite well. We're doing better than what we have done previously. Yeah. Go on, then. Last week was a choice. Yes. Over to Max. <laughs> so, sorry about that, by the way. So, this slide is what did work, which is more kind of, as I say, I can really add the things that did work rather than the things that didn't, because most of the times the things that didn't work are just things that people didn't really put in place. Mm. So, so the things that did help, so at primary school it was really uh, difficult because a lot of teachers actually didn't understand and then you'd get the odd one or two that would, which is, you know, at that time very lucky. But I had a teacher in year five that uh, sat me at my um, desk and she said, she, she knew I worried quite a lot, I was very anxious, very, all the time. And she gave me like my own day. She said, bring me bring some photos in about things that make you happy. So I stuck them on the wall and she gave me this green box. And um, basically she said, anytime you get worried, write down the thought and put it in the box. 
forget about it and we come to it at the end of the day and we can throw them in the bin if you want or we can talk about it. But what that taught me was really how to prioritise my worries. Because as soon as I put it in the box it was gone and I could carry on with my day as normal. Um, as beforehand it would all be up here and it would just, it would, it would disrupt my learning because I, I couldn't uh, process the, the worries correctly. Um, so she was a really good teacher. So what happened next with myself? So um, at the time I was still at the school with John. John had abandoned me by this point. Oh, I'm joined Oxford Brooks University, so I moved on to a different career. No, uh, John had uh, progress and obviously was doing a big, big thing for other teachers uh, going into the field. So you know, at the end of the day, you probably just spread the message more. Uh, but at the time I went to a cafe work experience and I realised in my first week that I never want to work in a cafe. <laughs> um, I hated it, I got the orders wrong, certain um, people, um, uh, all of it, I just was really bad with it. Washing up the texture for me is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good excuse at that. So, <laughs> I came to that. Uh, so I realised I didn't want to work there and then I then got some uh, work experience at Casino. So, um, so I walked in day one and I thought I knew everything about OT. And I got in the car later that day with my mum. She goes, How did it go? You know, you know every parent, right? They think you're a genius. You know, like, Oh, my son's brilliant. He's gonna... And um, literally, I, I just got in the car. She's like, How did it go? I was like, I know nothing about OT. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, they put like, six laptops on my desk and said, okay, we want you to build a domain network, off you go. And I was like, okay, I need no control panel, so, so yeah. So, um, I've done that. They were going to take me on for an internship, but unfortunately, they moved down to London. So, I was like, oh, okay, another kind of block. So, at this time, I went for an interview at Leaving College, and um, I was going to have to go into a course where you kind of have to get the grades to then go to the course that you want to do. But the person was so impressed with me, he said, I'm going to give you an unconditional offer. As long as you get the functional skills that you saw this year, I'll let you in. And I did. And um, then I went to Newby College. And obviously, that experience wasn't, wasn't great. But I persevered and I passed my course. And I made sure that I stuck it out. And then I passed the course in the end. I discovered my kind of love for acting, which I haven't actually mentioned. So I started doing acting. So um, there was a play in Newbury called The Passion. I was watching basically EastEnders and I said, I'd love to tell a story day in, day out like that. And I said, I'll get off your bum and do it. So I saw a play in Newbury and my line was literally, I still remember it, Ye worthy name, goodly and great, God increase all the comedy estate for thee who grant me until. That was my line. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone, my other line was, uh, can you pass me the bucket? And I was like, oh, well, this one. <laughs> so it's quite different. Yeah. Um, and then, so I've done that play, and then I've done the track on the Born Road, and I played the village idiot, so it's not far from the truth. Oh. So um, oh. that was a good role, actually, because I could just act drunk and stupid and brilliant. Um, and then off the back of the makeup artist who was doing the makeup for the, the production said she was doing uh, makeup for Blue all week four and that they were looking for extras. So I thought, oh, okay, um, that's, that's brilliant. Can I, can I go to it? And um, anyway, at this time, I just applied for a job at uh, Sovereign and I knew that I was going to have to get the bus to get there. But I kept saying to my mum, no, no, you're going to take me. No, 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 you're going to take me. I'm not going to get the bus. So when this role came up, it was in Landbrook. So I said, Mum, can you take me? And she went, no, you can get the bus. If you want to do it, you have to get the bus. So she used the fact that I was really anxious about something. She knew it would take something I absolutely love and absolutely didn't want to do to get me on the bus. And bless her, on the day I went, she was like, I can drive you if you want. And I literally said to my mum, I said, no, you're right, it's something I need to do. And I've done it. 
I drank, I spilled coke down my trousers, so I looked like I wet myself. Uh, I got there, I was asked to go topless for the production, I was like, no. I got in the line, someone in front of me was called Max, and they, they were like, what's your name? He was like, Max, oh, Max Green. He was like, no, what kind of names are? And then I'm behind him, I'm sitting there. Oh, and then, literally, I'm at the production, and I'm speaking to this, like, he's got to be like a 45-year-old guy, I'm getting on really well with him. And I've not even paid attention to like, his attire or he's wearing anything. And the director comes out and he's like, all right, bring on the topless women. And I'm like, what? what the hell am I? And then this guy was like, all right, bring on the guy with the bikini. And I'm like, what have I signed up for? And then they were like, okay, get, get the naked guy on. And then the 45 year old stood next to me, had a dressing gown on. And he just went like that. And I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? So, and they stuck me in the Hawaiian shirt and shorts. I looked like a cop out of Hawaii 05, but I looked absolutely stupid. And they put me off acting for a while. And I got in the car, my mum picked me up. She's like, How was it? I was like, I need to go home and shower. <laughs> it's terrible. So, off the back of that, while I was there, actually, the big thing was there was a rope separating the extras and the actors. And me being me, I was like, I want to know how to get into this industry. So me being me, I went over the road. So people were coming up to me going, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm an actor. I'm joining next week. I'm just seeing how the show's going and you know, how the filming shots are done. Yeah. And they, they were like, all right. So I just asked them loads of questions on how to get into the industry. For after that, I took the information away. And for a good year, I just started emailing every casting director I could find in the UK. Um, so while I'm doing that, I applied for a job at Sovereign. 300 people, very big size room like this actually, with the premises, and so it reminded me of that. But everyone turned up in a suit, and I turned up in checkered shirt and chinos, and I thought, oh my god, I might as well just go now. And then they got me to do an English and maths test, and I was like, right, that's it, I'm totally gone. And then um, out of my interview, and I took the book, I filled up, I filled up two notebooks up in those eight weeks. So I gave them evidence that I could do the work. So I didn't hear back for three weeks, and I thought, um, you know, I thought, no, I haven't got it. And anyway, they said, yeah, you have, you know, and I got the job. They were only meant to take on one apprentice, but they ended up taking two on. And one of my biggest obstacles was that, is I had to pass math, maths level two. So it took me seven times to pass, but I finally did it. Okay. Off the back of that, I let one apprentice of the year for West Farnham in 2016. And then I finally got my big acting break, so then I got my mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Holby City. <laughs> so I had a main part in Holby City, 13 scenes, main character for the episode. Off the back of that, I got an agent. So uh, now I've got an agent, she got me roles on Doctor, uh, Doctors. So I've been on Doctors twice. Um, so I was doing the acting career. This is where this man got back in my life, because he saw how well I was doing. Basically, um, yeah. Um, he, he, John got back in my life, he said, how are you doing? And then about a good month later, this role came up for the National Autistic Sign. They were looking for an autistic actor for their employment video. This is only 16% of people with autism in full-time work. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't changed in 10 years. So that was the basis of the campaign. Mm -hmm. He said I should go for it, I did. I got the part, and um, basically I do ambassador work for them now. So I do a lot of speeches, I go up to Parliament, and. I'll be honest, they are very, live life through tinted glasses, I like to say. They, they don't quite see the impact. Do it. Sorry, okay. So, um, I've spoken on BBC Breakfast, the right stuff, and uh, done that for Ford. So, I progressed in my career. I left Sovereign, become a senior IT analyst, um, and then I filmed for Santander. So, we've talked about this sort of, again, just to conclude this idea about compassion and focus approaches. I meet teachers regularly, I meet beginning teachers all the time, and I'm very confident that they care, they're compassionate, and they really want to do well by the children and young people that they work with. I've also met some, you know, some really good practice around supporting the well-being of staff, to support the well-being of their children and young people, but I've also talked to many teachers about how they feel that their well-being at times is neglected, and yet they spend a lot of time looking after the well-being of others. And interestingly, I think teachers find it quite difficult to articulate how they look after their own well-being as well. So the idea about this compassion-focused approach is very much about 
you know, compassion for others, which is really important, particularly education, that's, you know, through communication and connection, experiencing compassion from others, and that could be the school, the employer, it could be politicians, I doubt it is going to be at the moment, and there does need to be a bit more, uh, you know, compassion for yourself in that context, and this flow of compassion across there. Um, when we're thinking about the kind of things that actually, you know, really support this compassion-focused approach, and this is where I think, you know, it really does uh, make sense in terms of our interaction with children and young people. It is about thinking empathetically about the distress that these young people are potentially experiencing and being able to tolerate that distress. It's actually moving towards those difficult feelings rather than stepping away. It's not about isolation moves and excluding children that are clearly exhibiting um, you know, experiencing distress. It's moving towards that distress and trying to empathetically and sympathetically understand sensitively, see I'm getting all these things, <coughs> sensitively and non-judgmentally uh, where this distress is coming from. And again, it's that support through um, care for wellbeing. Actually then you can develop that it is a motivation, so compassion can be practiced if you like, through actually, you know, thinking compassionately, behaving compassionately, encouraging a sense of compassion in others so they can feel what compassion feels like. Some of our children and young people may not have had that uh, warmth and experience of sensitivity, and that can be quite difficult or uncomfortable. And again, paying attention to when we and others are being compassionate and potentially developing particular um, imagery around compassionate places, compassionate others. And, and so on. So there's much more out there around compassion-focused approaches, and we've only had 40 minutes really to try and explore uh, what's been developing over the last 40 years. But it is really about this notion of warmth and sensitivity, um, playfulness to reduce kind of stress. So actually, you know, opportunities to interact informally in particular contexts. Having that wisdom that we just find ourselves in this place at this particular time, and recognising that a lot of this distress is caused from an evolutionary perspective, which is actually generally there to protect us against external factors um, that actually we don't often come across anymore, like woolly mammoths and all that kind of stuff, or tigers, but those kind of external threats around performativity, um, you know, all that kind of stuff can create this feeling of distress in ourselves through our own self-awareness and through our own rumination and so on. But actually it's having that courage then to move towards rather than move away from these kind of difficult situations and really being there for others and so on. Um, I think this is really important. I'm actually encouraging non-conformity in front of a room of educators here. So I think this is really important as well. I'm going to conclude today. I think the biggest part, I don't think this personally, is, is um, again, Professor Paul Gill, but I do agree with it. And I always have tried to be non-conformist throughout my educational career and experiences. Um, but I think this is really important. Perhaps the biggest enemy of compassion is conformity, a preparedness to go along with the way things are or the way they have been, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of complacency, sometimes because our leaders tell us to do it. And this doesn't work. You know, zero tolerance, no excuses, isolating children, excluding them, doesn't work. We know that. All our special schools are full. You know, um, we need to be including children and young people. We need to be thinking about working with them in a different way through more nurturing approaches, you know, through solution-focused stuff, through restorative approaches, through values-based education, you know, all that kind of stuff is really important. If you want to read more about the work of Professor Paul Gilbert, this is a really useful paper. It's a freely accessible online introduction to compassion-focused therapeutic ways of working. Now, remember, this is actually initially um, working one-to-one -one in clinical context, but is now developing into a uh, more professional context with healthcare, um, and isn't presently, you know, or is presently being developed in education, but there's not a lot out there in terms of education. That's a really good paper, and I really like this as well. Compassion is the antidote to cruelty. Again, freely accessible through the psychologist, um, so that's a really good article to have a look at. Mary Welford has written two um, articles for secondary ed, um, and you can find those there. One in 2015, working with a number of special uh, secondary schools in the UK to develop compassion-based approaches to think about pupil um, and staff wellbeing, and that's been revisited in 2019. So again, just to catch up to find out what's been going on there about compassion-based approaches in education. Again, if you're working in a special school context, this um, publication came out last year. It's really interesting about developing a compassion-focused framework in schools. It's really identifying what you're already doing around compassionate ways of working and developing that further, really. But again, it's about supporting the well-being of staff 
and young people in context where they might be experiencing quite significant social, emotional, and mental health needs. Um, if you want to know more about Professor Paul Gilbert's work and other colleagues around compassion focused ways of working, the Compassionate Mind Foundation has loads of resources, audio clips, videos, um, and so on, and publications. If you're interested in attending a conference, this is the inaugural conference around compassion in schools for educators. So this is the first ever conference in the UK that brings together people like Professor Paul Gilbert, um, Dr. Mary Welford, Professor Catherine Weir, who's done loads of work about social emotional development and so on. And I'm lucky enough to have got on the agenda there as well, so I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I'll be thinking about compassion-focused ways of working with children and young people with special education needs and disabilities. Here's a bit of self-promotion before I go. Uh, two books that I highly recommend, because I'm in them, um, is Emotional Development Attachment in the Classroom, but that features um, people like Heather Geddes, um, Betsy Thierry and so on. This one here, uh, Mental Health and Behaving uh, World Within Schools. And this is where I critique government policy, that's all I do. Go to conferences, critique the government, um, particularly around approaches to behaviour and discipline in schools. I don't even run, I stay there. I'm ready for it. I hate to do some schools, but that's, I'm suggesting there that this is not working for a significant one of the children. And hopefully, in 2020, my doctoral research will be completed. And that's about the emotional work that teachers engage in, the support for their well being, and how compassion might help um, those of us that work in education. And so, yeah. our possible work as well. And we've, and we've been approached by Sage, who's a big um, uh, UK um, publisher, to write a book as well. So, yeah. so look out for that. Thank you.